All right, <clears throat> your name? Miles Becker. And your branch of service? Army. And your dates of service? Uh, 11, 15, 67 to 11, 15, 70. And today's date? Is 6, 7, 2012. And it's 10, 10 a.m. My name is Jim Reagan. Uh, the, give me your full name with your middle, middle name. Miles Johnston Becker. And where and when were you born? August 7th, 1948. And what was your pre-war education? I graduated from high school in Prattsburg, New York. The, uh, and what were you doing before you uh, went into the military? I got drafted and then I signed up because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. The, so what were you doing bef when you... Looking for jobs. Looking for jobs. And the, they weren't hiring them because of the draft age. And when did you enter the service? Uh, 11, 15, 67. And you, you, you said that uh, you had received a draft notice. And I, I received it in my junior year. Junior year in high school? Yeah. And then uh, the, so then you chose to enlist? Yeah. And w why the Army? Three-year commitment, Air Force was four, Navy was four, everything else was four. And the, uh, when you went in, uh, where did they first send you? Fort Dix, that's the basic training outfit. And, and, the, and what, what was your uh, specific training? After the eight weeks at Fort Dix, which is just basic training, getting you in shape and doing all the military combat strategy, you go to AIT, which could be anything from advanced individual training or advanced infantry training. I chose the engineer part, which was at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. In 1968, early 68, okay? And they trained me to run heavy equipment, which I wanted. And what was your unit? Uh, when I went over the first time, it was the 4th Infantry Division, 4th Engineers. It was stationed in Play Coup was their main base. And then I ended up in Doc Toe, and I never saw heavy equipment machines after that. You never saw any heavy equipment? No. I was uh, then trained to be an explosives expert with C4 and uh, carry on missions up in the mountains of the Central Highlands, which went into Cambodia, Laos, 1968, which Richard Nixon said we weren't in until 72. The uh Now, um, and you know, we, we're only going to talk about things you want to talk about. So you know, feel free to, if I ask anything, you know, uh, oh, feel free to ask. And the, I'm here to educate you too. Right. So, what were what was your most memorable experience? Or do you want to talk about when you first got over there? Well, let's. I'm going to. I told you before. I'm going to make this a political conversation, not sure. combat, because they've heard enough of the combat. Okay. Sure. It's not good. You can watch it on TV all you want. You know, Band of Brothers. Uh, Apocalypse Now, you can watch Platoon, which is the closest thing I saw to a real action type Vietnam War, okay? Uh, I will keep this to the political end of it. Uh, when I was up in the Highlands, I had got associated with the mountain yards up there, which are considered to be the low-level characters of the Vietnamese country. Uh, I would compare them to the to minorities in this country. But they were ferocious fighters and they were very loyal to us and more loyal to the, than the South Vietnamese Army. Okay, I don't know how they survived down there. I've mentioned this before in many other interviews that I'm surprised they even might be still alive up there. But they kept it themselves. They were a tribal, just like over in Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran. You know, they're tribal and they're independent, okay, just like the Kurds. Um, that was the first time I was over there. They were, they were very nice people. They were very loyal to us. Then I had to come home, and, but I had to go back again, and I'm not going to explain all that. But when I was over there the, fr the second time, I was stationed at Saigon Port, and I had the privilege of working with a, a professor from Saigon University, and he told us, I asked him how he felt about us being over there in 70. He said, it's time for you people to go home. We've had enough. And that was enough for me, too. Okay? 
There's no lessons being learned here because our leaders just haven't read books and get educated on how to fight these wars. We just continue to fight stupid wars. This, these two wars have turned out to be not where they should have been. No way should we be committed to a country for 10 years of fighting and sacrificing our soldiers when those people really don't appreciate us being over there anyway. Afghanistan has been run over about 15 million times ever since uh, Genghis Khan. You know, what are we doing over there? What are we doing? Our own special interest? I don't know what Afghanistan's got. Iraq, we all know what they've got. But why? Why? We got our own oil. I just don't get this, this history stuff. You know, and we got leaders here in this country who never served and, and dodged the draft in 1968. And, and now they're telling people we got to fight overseas. Okay? You got any more questions? The, do you mind if we go back to when you first got to the Highlands? Yeah. The, uh, so when you, when you first got to the Highlands, what was going on at the time? Well, there was a strategy over there at the time of fire base on a staggered position up the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which eventually ends up in the middle of the Cambodian and Laotian borders. Where they come together is where the Ho Chi Minh Trail came down through, and that was the heaviest concentration of North Vietnamese Army and VC, if you want to use that word too. They were all using that, and they tried constantly to bomb them them back into the second century, but you know they had other things to go through. They had their bunkers were like 25 feet into the ground. They had uh, all kinds of strategy over there to uh, outlast us, okay? Because you know the interest of the country was waning. But anyway, there was a fire base I was on for about maybe two days that was inside the Cambodian Laotian border, okay? Uh, and I'll review the I'll repeat the part about Richard Nixon saying in '72 that we were over there. We were over there, and we were over there big time. Special forces, maybe not part of the active army, I don't know. You have to explain that one. Green Beret, okay. okay. The, so, so you arrived in, in the Highlands, and the... Uh, right during the Tet season, okay? During the Tet season? Oh, yeah, okay. House to house in Pleiku. It was house to house in everywhere. Way. Uh, da Nang, Saigon, they were all doing it, okay? We were called in out of the, off the fire base to go in and help out, okay? Engineers did get involved, okay? The, so so where did they send you? I, I, was, I was called off this fire base called Doc To in to play coup for about a week or two, I think it was, okay? Just to clear the houses out, because that's where the VC and the NVA were located. Now, how long had you been been in uh, in Viet in country at that point? I think I think I was there uh, two months. Okay. The now during the, the the previous two months when when you got there, the uh, what were they having you do? Clearing fire bases off. Okay, which means either cutting the trees down or using the C4 on them because it was easier to get them out of the way. Okay. And uh, I was I was part of uh, about three fire bases that we cleared off. Okay. And the uh, so uh, on a, a regular basis, you know, or on a, your your routine would be to go out and clear Hel the area around that we go up that on a helicopter base, or get up on a helicopter dock tow and go out to the fire bases to clear off fire bases and set up a perimeter and uh, constant wire. And uh, I forgot the other thing, um, claymores. Okay, it's a long time. I got to remember this stuff. And the and, and so what was uh, your relationship with the uh, indigenous ind indigenous pe pe people? Well, up in the, up in that particular area, we never had to deal with the South Vietnamese Army that much. We had the the mountain yards, indigenous, if you want to use that word. Uh, we got along real well. They got along with us real well. They respected us, they knew we were up there for a reason, and, and, and in 68, I thought we were up there for a pretty good reason, okay? But as the war dragged on, I think the reasons became a little clustered, we'll use that word, okay? And I, I really do think the priorities started changing then. Now, did they live, uh, say you had a fire base, uh, would the village be nearby or? Yes, it was. It was like uh, within a mile of the fire base, the one I saw, okay? Uh, they lived in huts, okay? 
and grass huts. Right. And the so would each fire base be near a village? No, no. It, it, this one particular Dacto was uh, a pretty flat area, so they lived there. But up in the mountain, as it got into the mountains more, so into uh, Cambodia, it was uh, too mountainous for them. They were where they were. And I think there was a river there, but I'm not too sure where they were. So the, the idea with the fire base was it was... Uh, to stem the tide of the NVA, North Vietnamese Army, and the, the uh, Viet Cong. How, how near was it to the, uh, uh, to the trail? Right in the middle. Okay, it's about five miles from the Cambodian Laotian border, and the trail came right by us. Okay, and they had several trails. You can see it on an old map where all the arrows were. Okay, but the main concentration was right through us. And so the, uh, you know, since that was the major supply line for uh, the, the, the North Vietnamese Army, as well as the, the Viet Cong, the, uh, were they, what were their responses to the uh, development of all these fire bases along their supply well, line? Well, let me just say that with our air superiority, I'm telling those B-52s are bigger than any building around here. And the Phantom Jets, they kept them under control, okay? They were under control, okay? We had them, we had them good, okay? They just made a sudden surge during that tent, and that was it for a while. But occasionally they'd test the perimeters, and they'd throw out, you know, and they'd start maybe, a, a, well, the fire base I was on in 68 got surrounded by, they said, about five or six divisions of NVA. The 101st Airborne and the B-52s came in, and, and it took care of that, all right? Now, when you say <coughs> five or six divisions, how, how many, what would be the estimate of well, the, I, the numbers of them? I'd like to be able to answer that, but I don't remember too much what a division is anymore, okay? Well, I mean, in the American Army, it's like uh, a, a thousand. Or, well, no, I mean, four drums like 10,000, so. Oh, okay. uh, that would be close enough. The, That'd be uh, pretty close to about 50, 60, I don't know. They had us surrounded, and they came in there, the B-52 just b bombed it back into Cambodia and Laos. The, how many people were at the, the firebase? Fire, the fire I base. think it could have been uh, maybe a company. Maybe. A would have been maybe a hundred guys. Yeah. That's and, close and, and, and so suddenly you got uh, ten thousand <laughs> hostiles yeah. ringing around you yep. and cutting off your. Uh, well, let me just say this too. Okay, uh, that K San is the one that is in history. Okay, mm -hmm. Doc Toe, I don't think has been mentioned too much. Uh, Kaysan got run over about eight times. Uh, I had a Marine friend there and he was telling me about it. And that's in, that's in Platoon, that, that actual scene of taking over fire base by the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese Army is an actual factors where the guy covered himself up with the body, okay? That's actual. Um, it was scary, okay? The only way you could get into that fire base is by helicopter, okay? And they were laying it down pretty good. But they never took over because the B fifty two was coming there and settled them down a little bit. Okay. The so <clears throat> prior to the you know them surrounding the base, did did you have any indication that they were coming? Oh, there was rumblings everywhere. <laughs> okay, they were walking uh, what they call walking uh, artillery fire B B forty rockets, I guess you could call it, and uh, um, other rocket type ammunition. They were walking them up the perimeter to see how far they could get, okay? There was constant probing, constant, okay? And they, you could tell they were mounting it up, okay? Real, real easy. So, so what was the thinking among, among your fellows at the time? We tried to keep busy so we didn't have to put up, we didn't have to think about where we were at, okay? We knew, everybody knew, you should have seen the drop they had, the 101st Airborne, we had, that was a small airport there at Dato, okay, and it was constantly moving troops in, and they were moving right out, going right after them, okay. So when when you find about when what was would have been the period of time when when this occurred? May '68. May '68. So as as the as you, you know you and your uh, fellows discovered that, you know, you're at the, the point of the spear and that your your fire base is being surrounded, uh, 
how how many days you know did it take before you know they they, they had, had they had to cleared out in two weeks. Okay, like I said, the B-52s were very very effective over there. They've always been effective. I mean, you can't. I mean, I was the first experience I had with a B-52 raid was ten miles away from me, and I could feel that rumbling all the way to the firebase I was on. You could feel it was like an earthquake. That's how uh, effective they are. Very effective. They bring it on. So, so as as they began to drop uh, ordnance on, on these, sometimes people. it was right on the perimeter. Okay, we had to go hide. Okay, we were underground. Okay, find a place. They said because we were dropping it. Okay, they were coming. So, so you must, it must have mixed feelings at that point. Yes, I, I, I was hoping they weren't missing. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they no friendly fire. You know what I'm saying? Right, you know, okay, it was scary. Okay, it was scary, but you know, hey, we've managed. The uh, so how many days of uh, bombing was there? Uh, I think that they did three days of it and scared. They scattered them quite a bit, and then the 101st came in and scattered them all the way. It took about a two week cleanup before they got them all. Now, when, when you say the hundred, since this is an area that you can only get there by helicopter, well, or basically to an extent, yeah. how did the hundred first get there? Helicopter, and also they got C one forty ones, I think they are, and they call it a plane a, a caribou, which are able to land, uh, and disperse the troops, land them, and get out of there. Okay, they weren't in any problem at the time because the B fifty twos kind of scared them a little bit. Okay. And the Phantom Jets, they came in, they came in even closer than the B-52s did. Napalm everywhere, okay? Very effective. So the, uh, kind of lightened the scare word up, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, I sort of returned the favor to the, these guys. <laughs> you know, but it was sort of like a miniature battle of the bulge, okay? But, but it wasn't cold there, it was about, uh, at the time, I think it was about 75 degrees. It was considered cold over there because it was a monsoon season coming upon us. Okay, they were just trying to get their last jab in here before the rain. The uh, now the what, what were the during that that time period as opposed to when you came back uh, on the second tour the. Um, what was the feeling uh, with the men concerning, you know, what they were doing over there? I think I would like to say my feeling, and from the feeling of guys that were over there in '68, was very much in a, in approval of what they thought the mission was. Uh, and I think in '70 the, ch the mood had changed because of all the protesting back here, and the guys were ch were just not. It wasn't being justified by then. Okay. I don't think the South Vietnamese had their stomach in it anymore. Their heart and soul was obviously because they got they got run over as soon as we left. You know, I, I think that they just wanted us out of there, and uh, and I think they paid for that. I think they paid dearly with the North Vietnamese. Now, with the with the Montan Yards, the uh, what was uh, how how much direct contact were you had did you have with them during that? They were on patrols with us. They were out there with us. Uh, they weren't supplied too well. I mean, there was crossbows and muskets in their arms, okay? Uh, and then finally we got around to uh, arming them a little bit better, okay, with M1s and, I don't know, I think M14s, I think I saw a few of them with. They were very, very good with us, okay? They helped out a lot. The, so, so for some strange reason, the, South, the North Vietnamese Army left them alone just like the Kurds over in northern Iraq. They leave them alone, too. Was it because the Maatan Yards were, so, you know, knew their terrain very well and you Let's know, just say that they did, it's like taking on a, a, a bee, a wasp that you don't want to tackle, okay? You better leave it alone. Let, let sleeping dogs lie, okay? They left them alone. The uh, and they weren't treated very well after the Americans pulled out. The the South Vietnamese didn't want them around either. Okay, like I said, they treated them like they were uh, minorities. Okay, 
And they were indigenous, and they were very proud people, and they didn't want any part of the South Vietnamese either. Okay? It was mutual. Okay? So in 70, when he came back, yeah. the uh, take us there, you know, you, 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 <clears throat> I'm in Saigon at the time, so it's a whole different culture, okay? It's mostly uh, uh, Viet Cong that are down there. And, and, you know, I didn't see much going on from them as far as activity. And then I was stationed at Long Bend, uh Fort, I guess I could call it, or camp, which is about 10 miles outside of Saigon. It might be more than that, I can't remember anymore. Um, and we had to ride the bus every day from, Sa from Long Bin to Saigon Port and uh, work on the port with Vietnamese. They did most of the labor work while we did the pointing. That's another thing about their war, they didn't teach us the language, we had to learn it in stride as we go along, you know. Uh, Papasan, do that, you know. Okay, GI. Okay, we're fine. So uh, your your duties were to uh, supervise unloading loading and, and unloading. unloading. Yeah, and the LSTs and ocean side ships too. And the uh, now, what was the mood uh, in Saigon at the time? Uh, with the with the people. Well, both with the people and with the Americans. Oh, I think the GIs had enough. They they wanted out. I mean, they came back here and from 70 to 72 and made sure that their word was told to the Congress. Uh, the uh, South Vietnamese have, uh, well, like I told you, the professor there, but I think most of them, they had a job, quite a few of them had a job. They probably wouldn't have had a job if it wasn't for us. And uh, they weren't quite as vocal as him, as the professor. I thought he was telling me how they felt. Okay, and I, I agree with him and I heard him real loud and clear. The, you know, as someone who had been out in the field, in the field, and had seen you Both know sides. what what was really going on, the uh, you know in Saigon, do you think that the people there had a glimpse of you know what could come? Well, it's I, I thought for sure the way they were going that they thought that the North Vietnamese Army and the government of the North Vietnamese would let them off the hook, but they didn't. They didn't. They didn't. They treated them pretty poorly. As a matter of fact, some of them didn't make it. Oh yeah. I mean, the, 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 the now you were saying that there were there was a lot of Viet Cong in the yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and they were recruiting constantly down there. Okay, recruiting constantly. Now were they uh, doing anything to make your life difficult at the port? At the port, no. No, we were pretty safe down there, okay? Uh, like I said, it was two different wars. And the thing is, I'd like to be able to comment on, uh, on uh, what happened in 73 and 4 and 5 there, but I can't. I can't. I was, out, I was out of there in 70. I was glad to be home. And, and it wasn't quite as prevalent as when 73 through 5 came along when they started really making an impact in Saigon, okay? They infiltrated that city pretty good from what I've been told. All right? I'd like to be able to help you with that, but I can't. Now, the, uh, when you were home um, in 68, 69, what was the reaction to, where did you live at that time? All right, was, Pransburg is a very rural farming community down in Steuben County during the Pennsylvania border. Uh, there wasn't much reaction of anti or pro there. Everybody was going about their business and, and doing their own thing. Wasn't it kind of a shock to you that, you know, after what you had been through and seen and experienced and you come home and nobody seems to... Well, let me say this to you. When I came home in 70, I had a girlfriend who was going to school at Fredonia. And that's when I started catching some uh, opinions about that war, okay? But in 68, 69, I'm just wondering, at that point, you know, in my hometown, there was no pro or con. But what I'm saying is, or what I'm wondering is, for someone who had just seen what you had seen, and then to come home and these people don't realize what the troops are are experiencing, you know, okay. it must have been a real disconnect 
you know, when I came home in 68, it was because it was an emergency leave. My mother had died, okay? People weren't bothering me too much about any of that kind of war opinion, okay? They kind of felt a little sympathy towards me, all right? That's why I was stationed at the Seneca Army for depot for 13 months, because it was called a compassion reassignment. And after the assignment was done, I was sent back over there with eight months left in the service. So, and that was the Vietnamization program that Nixon was bragging about, but there was just as many troops going over as there were coming back. Yeah. Now, in, 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 when you were at the Seneca Depot... That's when Woodstock was on. Yeah. Okay. The, the uh, you know, what were people thinking, uh, what, you know... See, you're in a conservative state here. Upstate New York is very conservative. There wasn't much activity going on off the campuses, okay? Right. The Seneca Army Depot at the time, when I was there in 69, was not getting any kind of flack because it, loads of ammunition was coming out of there on big, big cargo planes every day going to Vietnam, okay? There was no activity on that post at all. Off post, like, you know, protesters or anything, none, none. Now, so 70, you're there, you know, you're back, the, you're dating a girl who's going to Fredonia. Uh, what are you hearing at that point? Well, there were some statements being made, and it's an old, it's old stuff, okay? Oh, there was the child killer, the pregnant mother killer, all that kind of stuff, all right? You know, what are you doing over there doing that stuff? And, you know, it's fine. That's fine. Say your opinions. I didn't do any of that stuff, you know? So we had to justify the reasons for I mean, you know, those it, kind of comments, okay? It, 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 it the campuses were alive with radicalism, okay? You know that as well as I do, all right? The, I mean, no... Well, I think every war has had, you know, some protesters, but no, no military, no, you know, uh, war, I think, has had that kind of, of nasty, you know, vicious attacks. Well, here you go. See, this is something you don't know too much about the history of this country, then, because the Civil well, War, Civil War, about, there, were, the Civil War there, there, were, there were draft rights, yeah. but, but the killings and hangings, too, by yeah, the way. And the, the, you know, and like I said, even World War One and World War Two had, you know, its peace protesters, yeah. but in v during the Vietnam conflict, people were personalizing it, you know, to attack the troops and accuse them of heinous things that, you know, as opposed to being against the war, you know, being against Lincoln or being against, you know, uh, fighting the South, the, uh, the, the, I mean, they, they, We've never seen that kind of, you know, during the uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, whatever. Okay. People I know made, where you're going with made, this. made a much more not I know, to I know where you're going criticize the troops like they did during the Vietnam War. Okay, the media was a, was a big influence during that war. You will not see that again. The, the media is not covering this war like they did that one. Dan Rather was over there in the bunkers, okay? He gave his full account of that war, and so did a lot of other ones uh, that reported the war. A lot of them got killed over there, okay? They gave this negativity after 69, 70, when the protests started getting really huge here, okay? And I'm not saying whether it was good or bad. All I can say is that we lost our direction in 69, 70. I don't think that McNamara knew what he was doing to begin with, okay? Uh, you remember Bob McNamara. Oh, yeah. He's the one that wrote the book to get himself in heaven. And he didn't deserve to go wherever he was. He needed that. He needed that little push, by the way. You've got a couple of people in this town here who served in the, in the office, too, who didn't deserve to go as far as they went. You want me to mention their name? Because they can. Sure. Yeah, Senator Jim Wright burned his draft card in the post office in 1969. Jack, uh, I forgot his name, he was the county administrator, draft dodger. John McHugh never served, and now he's the Department of the Army. Okay, I, I, I just, I don't get any of this, you know. How come they get to go up to, up to high office and they never, they, I don't mind protesting, you know, protest and burn your card, but how'd you get to be a New York State Senator? You know, I, I, I just don't get it. And the rest of us are slugging it out down here that served in a war. So you answer the question. I'm not gonna. <laughs> they don't have any answers. Yeah, well, the, neither does the rest of the country either. You know. The uh, so the during that, you know, as things continued to to unravel, 
uh, you know, w when you returned home uh, and got out, well, what did you? Well, I stayed. I stayed in my hometown for a couple of years. There was no protesting going on in that small community. Okay, although I did get a couple shots from my father and my girlfriend's father about uh, you war heroes come back here, you think the country owes you a living. I didn't think the country owed me anything. I was just trying to settle in and try and find something to work on, you know. Um, other than that, I, went, I even worked in Rochester for a couple of years and went to Monroe Community College. It wasn't too bad there. Monroe was very good with us. There was something like 1,200 uh, Vietnam veterans there, and it was a very good college to go to. But when I moved on to Brockport and this college out here, they still had the attitude there. Even in 1980, when I graduated out here, they still had attitudes. You know, that's 10 years later, and they're still coming up with it. Now, so in in uh, 74, as you know, they're withdrawing, and then when uh, Saigon fell, what was going through your mind? About time. We should have left there. We should have left in 70 when he said he was pulling everybody out. It was time to go. You never spend 10 years in a war. If you can't get it done in, in at least five, what are you doing? Time to move on. You know, and we weren't doing a good, any of them any favor. Okay? They called, it was back in the Cold War days of communism. You know, oh, watch out. And Ho Chi Minh was supposed to be our friend during World War II. I don't get any of this. We're friends one day and enemies the next. Now we're back being friends with them again. They're making windmills over there and we're buying them. I, I don't get it. You just sacrificed 58,000 troops over there and now we're friends again? I don't get that. And the Germans have filed, I, I, I gotta go for this. The Germans, okay, two wars, maybe three we'll call it, Russian Frank, Franco war, Prussian Franco war. Three wars, we crucified them, all right? Now, they're bailing Europe out. And they got Europe right by the neck right now. And how do you figure all that? German intu intuition, I guess. Uh, <laughs> intuitiveness, I guess. I don't know. The, the, so what would... A couple more questions, okay? Sure. The, uh, w w what would you like to talk about? Uh, I think I've covered just about all I could. The, only, uh, the vice president of this country, Cheney, took six deferments during my war, and he said he had other priorities. What kind of a leader is that? And George Bush, I'm a Republican city committeeman. If you think I'm not ashamed of all this, I am. Bush, he's on the Texas Air National Guard. All of a sudden, he's getting a call up, and his father gets him transferred to Louisiana, where he isn't going to get called up. These guys got a lot of nerve. A lot of nerve. You know, you can't justify that to me. And I'm sure I'm not speaking only for just myself. I haven't talked to anybody because I'm trying to forget. You know, a, a couple years ago I had an award trying to be given to me, and I told him, what for now? It's 42 years later, what are you going to give me an award for now? Forget it, I don't want it. I don't want nothing. Put it in the Hall of Fame down there in Saratoga, okay? Shut the camera. Enough. <laughs> <laughs>